13th of June 2021 and I'm midway through the second season of Brunelling through Britain. I'm now in South Wales and up to now this is my 51st day out, 7,100 odd miles on the clock and about 151 Brunel places. The book I'm writing is called On the Tracks of Isla Barking the Brunel. It's a compendium um, including not just the iconic works of Brunel but some of the most minute examples of work that he did. But this is not a minute example here at Britain Ferry in South Wales. This was one of Brunel's harbour schemes. He built the docks in Bristol, Plymouth, Brentford, Monk, Wearmouth, north of Sunderland and here at Britain Ferry. And during this difficult period I'm always pleased to be out away from the crowds, out brunelling with the camera. But today's a special day because online I learned of a group that are preserving the waterfront here at Britain Ferry. In the days of the agriculture, the industrial revolution, iron steel was needed by the world and it was brought down from the land of the valleys for you, down to Britain Ferry, just east of Swansea, to be exported. And Brunel had to build a harbour here to accept ships. And I'm very pleased to meet up with three members of this organisation that preserved the Britain Ferry. And I want to introduce you to Hugh, a local councillor who is an expert on Brunel in this area. And fortunately, he can speak Welsh, and I would be embarrassed in trying to pronounce the place name. So I introduce Hugh. So please join us in the video and tell us why you're interested in Britain Ferry. Well, thank you, Michael, for several reasons. You rightly say this is a certainly uh, one of the icon works of item marketing in Brunel. He did come to Britain Ferry, and as you could see for yourself, you probably asked the question, why has this never been restored? And I think it's never too late, and a few of us want to get together, and we want to see that his works here are restored. It's unique from a number of points. It's unique that he diverted the river. Uh, he used his father's design, Mark Brunel, to build a single lock gate, 56 foot wide, and it was a single floating dock. And uh, also, uh, he made it one of the major ports at that time for the export of coal in South Wales. But whereabouts on the River Neath did he divert it? Was it to the south of here or north? It was the south of here as you go down towards the estuary and what? into the Bristol Channel. Right. Now, can you explain the configuration of this harbour complex? You've got a jetty here, a wood, stone, outer basin, inner basin with a lock gate. Can you give us a configuration dimension? Yes, I can, Michael. You're looking straight away in front of you at what was an outer harbour, an outer wharf, where the moored ships coming in here, very, very busy, before they entered into the outer basin here, which is tidal, passing the outer harbour across the way here, and also before you got into the single lock gate further up. And hard to believe, it was a very long dock, and a lot of it is still here. That is as it was built. This is as it was built right behind us. And the gate, half the gate, is still there. Uh, and that, that lock gate, his son mentioned it was a, or authors, that was a world record for the actual size or type of it. Well, there was some world record about it, but contrasting that, the north side of the dock, the outer basin, the walls disappeared and it looks rather unkempt. And when you go to Plymouth, Brentford, Bristol, they're all restored and lots of people are visiting and it's a shame that this is not done here and the landscape here is far prettier than I thought and it was more unspoiled than I thought and I think there's room for development because you've got the space. You are absolutely right, you're singing my from my song sheet. Tell us about yes. that tower up there that's the, ta the tower itself which we restored a few years ago as the start of phase one of all this Michael is an accumulator tower worked by hydraulics off steam and the purpose of that tower was to operate the, the lock gate itself. But it certainly stands out. The last part of this video I'd like you to tell the audience about is about the railway line that led from here up into the hills or mountains. I would just introduce it by saying this. Brunel's son 
shows us how his father paid attention to every minute detail in his empire across Britain. And he's mentioned that Brunel designed coal trucks that opened up at the bottom at a certain distance from the chute to prevent the brittle coal from disintegrating. Now that is a feature that will feature in my manuscript that you should find interesting. But tell us about the route and the bridges on the way. Well, the route, as you saw this morning, is, is fascinating. He built a railway all the way from the Corrug and the Avon Valley at the top, right over this hill here, this beautiful wooded mountain. And it was so steep, he made it a finicular railway, one of the first in the world, and it was here in Britain Ferry. And the purpose was that the steam engines would come to the top of the incline, the wagons would go down on rope operated, down to what is now what we call our local Jersey Park, and the bridge is still there, and then right down, crossing the old South Wales Railway, which Brunel was involved with building as well, to this docks here. And it exported coal like that all over the world. One postscript though, over there, out of camera shot, is a circular tower, which you told me about. Can you tell the audience what that is, please? I, We've never read about that anywhere. I can. They wonder what it is. They think it's a pillbox. It's not. Yeah, that's right. It looks like it, uh, but apparently Brunel, had an idea to sink a tunnel shaft through there to see if it was feasible to go right through under the river here directly to Swansea and beyond. And it never never happened because it was really an unsafe uh, river surrounds, quicksand, etc. Uh, but that shows what he was like. He'd have a go at anything and he was so advanced of his time. Well, that's what leads me on to conclude the video by saying when you write a book of Brunel, no one has ever done the man justice because we read that he worked about 17 hours a day, six days a week, which is equivalent of two people's careers. And authors have never crammed all that information into a book, which must need about a thousand pages. And this is what Brunelling has taught me. It's bringing me in contact with the iconic to the least known works. And we're going to step out of shot we're going to pan the camera to finish the video. Thanks very much, Hugh, for well, your thank, contribution. Well, thank you, Michael. Good luck in the book, and let's hope we can, uh, can process this and uh, support us. Thank you. And what's you. the name of your organisation? The Brunel Trust Group. And it's online? It's online, yes. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.